We're going to be in Luke chapter 9, verses 12 through 17. Luke chapter 9, verses 12 through 17. Today is a communion Sunday, and with that in mind, we're going to continue the pattern we've set a few months back of just taking a snapshot and looking at some of the meal scenes that are in Luke's gospel. Luke's gospel is interesting because there's seven scenes that take place around a meal, and for that reason, there can be some interesting observations that relate to communion just by looking at them. Uh, so again, our text is Luke chapter 9, verses 12 through 17, a familiar account uh, that we're going to read together this morning and make our observations. And so follow along with me as I read. <clears throat> now, the day was ending, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away, that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside and find lodging and get something to eat. For here we are in a desolate place. But he, that is Jesus, said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless perhaps we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to the disciples, Have them sit down to eat in groups of about 50 each. And they did so, and they had them sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and broke them and kept giving them to the disciples to set before the people. And they all ate and were satisfied, and the broken pieces which had been left over were picked up, about 12 baskets full. And so here we are looking at one of the more famous miracles uh, in the Scripture. Uh, most of us have heard about it. Uh, most of us have you know, remember speaking about it multiple times in Sunday school. And this one's interesting in particular because many people who are not Christians or have not been immersed in Christian culture have heard of it as well. It's a, one of the more famous ones. And this miracle is one of the more famous ones for a reason. Uh, it was truly spectacular. And here's what I mean when I say it was truly spectacular. Follow along. I'm going to just throw some details up on the board. Um, and uh, I'll ju give you some time to follow along if you want to write these things down. If not, we're recording this, and you'll be able to go back and capture this on the website as well. But to begin with, Jesus fed more than 5,000 people. Uh, he fed 5,000 men, plus the women and children that were with him. And I'm going to say that again just to be clear. It talks about the feeding of the 5,000 here, but what he fed was 5,000 men plus women and children. And we, we, it's kind of implied in the Gospels, but in Matthew's Gospel in particular is where we see this clearly stated. So I'm going to go ahead and give that to you now. This is Matthew 14, verse 21, where it says, They were about 5,000 men who ate besides the women and children. So there was 5,000 men plus women and children. Now, 5,000 people alone is a pretty impressive number. But when you include, include the women and the children with them, it's fair to estimate that the crowd Jesus fed was probably somewhere more in the range of twice that much. That is to say, it's generally agreed upon that this crowd was probably somewhere around 10,000 people, possibly even more than that. And 10,000 people, again, is a very impressive number to hear. But it's even more impressive when you stop and try to visualize what 10,000 people might look like. And so I'm going to just throw a few images up on the board to help us get our mind wrapped around what this crowd might have looked like that Jesus fed. And obviously, uh, we can't, uh, uh, th these are contemporary images, so it's not uh, a perfect analysis. But here's about 100 people. This is what 100 people looks like, okay? Decent sized, group, decent, decent sized group of people there. And this is what happens when you take 100 people and multiply it by 10. This is about 1,000 people, okay? Again, decent sized group of people. Now, this is about what 3,000 people looks like, and we're starting to look at a great, kind of a great big huge sanctuary, you know, with the balcony and all. We're getting in the 3,000 person range here. Now, I looked and looked, but I didn't find a picture of 5,000 people that I liked, so I'm going to stop here and say that's 3,000 people. That's a lot of people, um, and 5,000 people is like almost twice again what that is, all right? And instead, what I want to do is I want to jump ahead to what 10,000 people might look like. And now, now we're getting in the range of 10,000 people here. You're talking like a sports stadium. And this last image that's up on the board now is closer to the crowd size that Jesus fed with a young boy's lunch of five loaves and two fish. And this is spectacular, is it not? It's absolutely spectacular when you stop and think about that. But there's more to this miracle than that. It's not just the size of the crowd. Jesus fed this crowd until they were completely satisfied. He fed all of those people 
until they were completely satisfied. And we see that in verse 17. Let me give you just one more second and then we'll move on. It says in verse 17, and they ate, and they all ate, excuse me, and were satisfied, and the broken pieces which they had left over were picked up, and they were 12 baskets full. And so in other words, no one in this huge crowd went home hungry. Everyone ate till they were full, and there were leftovers, all right? That is spectacular. That's exciting stuff. But that's not everything. There's actually more when you stop and think about this. Also, he fed this entire crowd with prepared food. With prepared food. Jesus fed this entire crowd with, ba with baked bread. Five loaves, okay? And the simple fact that Jesus fed all these people with prepared food in itself is a very spectacular detail that is often overlooked and not talked about. Um, nowadays, we can conceptualize the idea of thousands of people being handed a prepared meal. For those of you who have been in the military, you know what it's like to go to the chow hall or to the cook tent and be handed just tray after tray of food. If you've ever been to a disaster relief uh, site, uh, like when I was in Hurricane Katrina, there were thousands and thousands of people just being moved through and fed meals. It's done nowadays. We have the technology to pull this off, but nothing like this existed in Jesus' day. Um, even the Roman army, which, is the mo which was, I, sh I should say, the most technologically advanced of the day, um, did not feed its troops in the field with a prepared meal. Uh, Roman soldiers were fed with rations of grain, which they had to mill for themselves and turn into bread or porridge on their own. Uh, there was no such thing as, uh, as having a prepared meal cooked and handed to you. It just didn't happen back then. Um, and with that in mind, to hand this huge crowd that we just talked about baked bread is something no one had ever seen, no one had ever heard of before. It was just mind-blowing in every way. So again, this miracle was absolutely spectacular. And that's probably why it continues to be so well known today. However, there is another detail about this miracle that is truly fascinating. And this is the detail that I want to focus more closely upon today. And that is this. Jesus fed this crowd through his disciples. Jesus fed this crowd through his disciples. That is to say, Jesus did not feed the crowds directly. He did not pass the bread to them himself. Rather, he passed the bread to his disciples, and then the disciples distributed it to the crowds. You follow me? He didn't go to them with the bread. He gave the bread to his disciples, and the disciples took the bread to the crowds. It's very interesting when you notice that. We see it in verse 16. Here it is. He, then he took five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them, and he broke them, and kept giving them to the, to the disciples to set before the people. And so Jesus took the few loaves and the fish that the boy had given and handed it to the disciples. And as he handed the bread and the fish to them, he multiplied it in some miraculous way that the text really doesn't go into and doesn't really matter. And the disciples, for their part, merely received the multiplied bread and fish and then carried it to the crowd. Nonetheless, the hungry crowds received the bread and fish from the hands of Jesus' disciples, not Jesus himself. Again, Jesus multiplied the bread. He handed it to his disciples. The disciples took it to the people. And so from the crowd's perspective, they received the multiplied bread from the disciples. That's where they got it from. And that is very interesting. Jesus performed this miracle. He's the one who multiplied the bread, but the crowds experienced it through the hands of this, the disciples. And so in this account, Jesus fed the crowds through his disciples. And this is a very fascinating detail. And believe it or not, there is quite a bit we can learn from this. And we're going to spend the rest of our time together this morning unpacking it together, okay? So follow along with me. There are actually three observations we're going to make from the fact that Jesus fed the crowds through his disciples, all right? Three observations here. Firstly, this has always been Christ's intention. It, it, it has always been, excuse me, Christ's intention to feed the crowds through his disciples, to minister to the crowds through his disciples. It's always been his intention to do so. It's always been Jesus' intention for the overwhelming abundance of his kingdom to be experienced in this fallen world through the hands of his followers. What we're seeing here in this passage is not an anomaly. It's not something unusual. It is a pattern 
that Jesus followed throughout his earthly ministry. He did it the whole time. This is what he did at the beginning of his earthly ministry when he sent his disciples out in pairs. And if we see in Matthew 10, verse 1, Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And so even that early on, as his disciples were going and ministering, they were experiencing the abundance of God's kingdom at the hands of the disciples. Very interesting thing. And just before he went to the cross, he told them that this would continue to be the case after he ascended. And I'm quoting from John chapter 14 and verse 12, where it says, Truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Again, he's saying the world is going to continue to experience the abundance of the kingdom through your hands. Very, very powerful thing to realize. And with this in mind, we shouldn't be surprised to see Jesus ministering to the crowds through the hands of his disciples here. It's not an unusual thing. It is the norm. It's not the exception. It's always been Christ's intention to distribute the abundance of God's kingdom to the world through the hands of his followers. This is why we're here. This is what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be passing the bread, distributing the abundance, the eternal, the infinite abundance of the kingdom um, while we're here. And this naturally leads to our next observation, and this is the one I want to park on a little bit longer, okay? And that is this. The world suffers when we neglect our responsibility to pass the bread. The world misses out when we neglect our responsibility to pass the bread. Part of the reason that this miracle was so incredible and so effective was because Jesus' disciples were faithfully carrying the bread and the fish to the crowds. As Jesus multiplied, they were on hand to take what he multiplied to the hungry people. And with this in mind, we have to ask ourselves this question. How would this whole scene have gone if the disciples were not there to pass the bread? The bread? Or how would this have gone if Jesus had to feed a crowd like this all by himself? Or how would it have gone if the disciples had just taken enough of the bread to satisfy themselves and not bothered to pass it on to the rest of the people? And I think the obvious answer here is, is not nearly as well. There would have been a lot more problems. People would have been neglected. And now, of course, some of you might be choked. Excuse this, by the way. That wasn't supposed to happen yet. Um, some of you might be actually choking on that statement uh, when I say that it wouldn't have gone as well because um, acknowledging that feels a bit like we're suggesting that Jesus depends upon us. You know, and th that's what naturally, you know, wait a minute. You know, are, are we saying Jesus isn't all powerful here or something like that? So if this is you right now, keep in mind that there's nothing that even remotely resembles equality between Jesus and his disciples in this account. Nothing about this even remotely resembles equality between them. Jesus does all the heavy lifting in this account. He's the one multiplying the bread and the fish. He's the one providing all the direction. All the disciples are doing is taking what Jesus gives them and passing it on. That's all they're doing. They're just taking what he gives them and passing it on. No one can do what Jesus did here. No one can. But everyone can do what the disciples did. And that's the point, right? No one can do what Jesus did, but everybody can do what the disciples did. It doesn't take talent. It doesn't take ability or education or connections to be a bread passer. Just passing the bread. That's all you're doing. It doesn't take a PhD in nuclear physics to pull that off. You're just passing the bread. No one is capable of doing what Christ did in this situation, but everyone is capable of passing the bread on, passing on what Christ did. Only Jesus can multiply the bread, but it's up to his followers, it's up to us to pass it on to the crowds, to the multitudes. Jesus set things up this way for a reason, and I don't fully understand why. I don't think any of us do. We'll have to ask him when he gets there. But in the meantime, we have a job to do. We are called to be bread passers here. We don't multiply the bread, but we are called to pass it on. And if we neglect this responsibility, the world is deprived of kingdom blessings that it desperately needs and God intends for them to have. Now, we have all of the best intentions in the world. We all tend to want to pass on the bread, but I want to take just a couple minutes now um, and highlight some of the ways that we can inadvertently neglect our responsibility to pass the bread, and here's where I want to advance now. Um, first, 
We can fail to pass the bread when we isolate ourselves from our community. You know, we can fail to pass the bread when we isolate ourselves from our community. And I want to be clear that we do things like this unintentionally and with the best of motive in mind, all right? Sometimes our well-intentioned zeal for moral purity can motivate us to pull back and to withdraw from the world around us. And this isn't to say that we aren't cordial and that we're not respectful to the world around us, but sometimes our moral differences with the world around us can cause us to become uncomfortable and it can cause us to want to live apart and a little bit separate just to be able to breathe a little bit. And this makes it hard. I mean, it's understandable why we do it sometimes, but it makes it hard to, pa to pass on the bread. It makes it hard to pass on the blessings of Christ and his kingdom that are intended for our community when we do this. In order to be a bread passer, we need to live fully among our community. We need to work where they work. We need to celebrate where they celebrate, play where they play. We need to be with these people in every way and engage with them. God wants to enhance our community's lives where they are, all right? And we need to be where they are in order to be the ones to be able to distribute the bread to them. It's just as simple as that. If they have to come to us, if they have to find us, if they have to come to us to be able to get those things, the whole system breaks down and we're failing in our responsibility. We have to be out there with them, okay? Secondly, we fail when we overextend ourselves beyond our community. And so the first one, we isolate, but we can also overextend as well. This is also well-intentioned, all right? Sometimes our well-intentioned zeal for outreach and missions can motivate us to attempt to reach the whole world for Jesus. You ever, you ever hear those slogans, reaching the whole world for Jesus, getting the whole world for Jesus, those kind of things? You know, it sounds great on paper, right? We start strategizing. We start dividing the whole world into sections. We start doing population density studies and evaluating ministry in terms of saturation and outreach and such things as that. And it's really exciting on paper because it's so globally focused and we're reaching the whole world for Jesus and bringing home the king and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not saying that this stuff is all bad. I'm not trying to overly sound negative here, but sometimes these big global ministry visions can just get in the way of us being present in the communities that we are, all right? Just being present here. Right? And that's a problem, because when we try to pass the bread to everyone, we end up passing the bread to no one. It's a problem. We don't want to do that. It's a mistake. We can only pass so much bread at a time, all right? And I, I think it's worth noting here that Jesus himself, in this account, didn't attempt to pass the bread to everybody there. He didn't even try to do it. He had... And if his disciples, if he had just sent them, and they had all individually tried to pass the bread to everyone there, the whole thing would have broken down as well. Everything came together because the crowd was divided up into bite-sized pieces. And we see this in verse 14. He said to his disciples, have them sit down to eat in groups of about 50 each. And when you stop and think about it, that is a very practical thing to do. Very practical. You've got thousands and thousands of people. He says, have them sit down, divide up into 50s, all right? What does this do, essentially? It takes the huge crowd and divides them up into a bunch of smaller, more manageable crowds, but it does something else as well. You notice that it actually creates paths in between these groups so that the disciples can move on through there and get to each one. Very, very logical, very practical move to make. And this all came together because all the disciples were willing to intently focus on smaller groups of people. And the same is true today. Passing Christ's bread effectively isn't about how many we can, people we can reach all at once. It's about how well we can focus upon the groups of people in our community that God has called us to reach. And if we would pay more attention to where we are and less attention to trying to reach the whole world for Jesus all at once, we would probably do a lot more to reach the whole world for Jesus. Does that make sense? It, it really does take a lot of people focusing on the little groups that we have. And it's really easy to get distracted, and it's well-intentioned, but it happens. Thirdly, another way we can fail is when we view the challenges in front of us as too big for God to handle, okay? Passing Christ's bread is about seeing impossible situations in this world and having the faith to reach out to God to intervene. That's what it's about. For example, in John chapter 2, when they were at this wedding and the wine ran out, Mary reached out to Jesus to intervene. 
And as a result, the whole wedding feast was benefited. And it was a very practical situation, too. It was, it was wine he created. It was a party he facilitated. He even met the needs. That he and he, his abundance uh, was poured out even in that setting, okay? And it happened because Mary reached out to him and said, hey, can you help with the situation? That's very impossible, all right? And this comes together for us when, as Christ representatives, we reach out in faith in these times when we encounter these impossible situations and we reach out in faith and ask God to intervene. And it breaks down, though, when we start to make decisions for ourselves about whether something's too big for God to handle. When we look at a situation and say, oh, that stinks, you know, yeah, this is just too much. You know, and you, you don't bother reaching out for it. Um, the disciples were making this very type of mistake in our text here, and Jesus confronted them about it, and I'm going to show it to you now in verses 12 through 14, okay? Now the day was ending. And the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away, that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside and find lodging and get something to eat. For here we are in this desolate place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless perhaps we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Uh, they, the disciples saw the problem of feeding the crowd as an insurmountable problem. And they began to look for alternate solutions, send them away, have them buy food. They were trying to figure out alternate solutions to be able to address such the situation. Uh, but Jesus taught them that impossible situations like these are fantastic opportunities to demonstrate the abundance of God's kingdom if they would just reach out to him for that, okay? And that's what he did. That, that's exactly what he was teaching them there. And so we have to ask ourselves the question here, how often do we miss opportunities to pass the bread of the kingdom of God because we view the challenges that are in front of us as too big and we don't even bother asking for help, all right? There are all kinds of situations where that happens. When we go out in the world, we see them all the time. Big problems, big insurmountable things, things that we can't fix on our own, but God can, all right? And believe it or not, this week, we got hit with one of those as a church and one of our families got hit with one of those. And I'm looking right back at you guys right now. But we all know this now. Deb got a very, very tough medical diagnosis this week. And it's the kind of thing that can seem like an insurmountable challenge. And, you know, you, start, you can start strategizing in your head trying to find alternate solutions. But in reality, this is a fantastic opportunity to reach out to God and to have him pour out the abundance of his kingdom and to see what he will do in this situation. And we're going to do that today, okay? We're going to do that here shortly and in a couple minutes, but there are all kinds of opportunities like this, but we have to have the faith to reach out and ask. He's not always going to say yes. Sometimes he's going to say no, but we still need to ask and have some confidence. Lastly, we fail when we respond with words only, but no bread, okay? Words only, but no bread. It's kind of obvious, but it's worth noting here that Jesus did more then wish this hungry crowd well and say, I'll pray for you and pray for God's speed as you go and find food. He actually fed them. He didn't just pray for them, he fed them. And I'm not, I'm not trying to say that praying for people isn't valuable, I'm not saying that at all. But he prayed and he acted. And in the same way today, we pray and we act. And we pray for God to act. We don't just say, I'll pray for you and I wish you well. A part of passing the bread is actually meeting these felt needs and praying for God to meet these felt needs in a tangible way. That's exactly what he did there. Does that make sense? All right. We are called to pass the bread. And when we don't do our job, the world that we are called to reach is missing out. They're the ones that go without. We're here for that purpose. But there is one more observation here that's important to mention. All right. And that is that faithfulness brings with it a spiritual danger. And what I mean here is that we just talked about the problem we have when we don't do our job. But when we do do our job, we're actually exposed to another problem, and we need to be aware of it. You know what that problem is? The problem is pride, okay? And here's what I mean. We've already seen that it is Christ who multiplies the bread, and all we do is pass the bread along. However, that is not always the way the crowds will see it, okay? The crowds will be experiencing Christ's bread through our hands. And inevitably, 
because of the way they experience it, they're going to want to attribute Christ's work to us. It's going to happen. If we're out there and we're passing the bread, they're going to experience the kingdom of God through our hands. And when it happens, they're going to say, you did it. And it can be very easy in those scenarios to think, oh, maybe I did, and start to go to your head a little bit. And it, and it can actually ruin everything when that happens. Christ multiplies the bread. You're just the knucklehead passing it along. Everybody can do that. No one can do Christ's job. But when we get tricked into believing that we did something that we didn't do, it can become a real problem real fast. And I know we all think we're humble. I, I know. Uh, I think I'm humble too. But then something will happen and I'll be surprised. But you'd be surprised how easy that stuff just clicks and you don't even realize it's happening. I've shared this story before. Uh, some of you have probably already heard it, but it's been a long time, so I'll share it again. This reminds me of a situation when I was a kid. Um, and I was uh, walking down the road, pushing my bike in a community uh, that we lived. And I was, it, it was on a back road, and there was woods off to my right. And I heard these loud screams, blood-curdling screams coming from the woods. It was, it was, it, they were female voices, just, ah, help, you know. And in that moment, for whatever reason, I was just, I, I was, there was no one around. I was alone. I dropped my bike right where, where it was. And I went right into the woods, and I just started tearing through the woods, just flying towards these voices. I wasn't even thinking about it. Just, I heard help, I heard screaming, and I just ran right in there. And when I broke out the other side, what I saw were two young girls screaming, going, help, help. And I broke out of the woods, and I said, what's going on? And they pointed right where I was staying and said, there's a snake there. And I was looking, uh, at first I looked around, I was like, uh, you know, no snake. Didn't see a snake there. Um, and I believed them. We were in, this took place in Georgia, and there were water moccasins, there were copperheads, there were even rattlesnakes down there during the summertime. So it, it wasn't that I didn't believe them, but for whatever reason, the snake that they saw was no longer there. I don't know if I scared it away or something when I came bursting out of the woods, but he wasn't there. And so I looked back at them and I said, there's no snake here. It's all good. You can come. Because they, there was a creek, uh, and they were on the other side of the creek, I said, you can come across now. You're safe. Uh, and the one girl said, you know, she was hesitant, but then she came across. But there was another girl over there, and she was not budging. She was terrified by that snake, and she just was not budging. And I was like, you're safe. It's okay. You can come across. She's like, mm -mm -mm -mm. no, no, no. It's all right. You're safe. You can come across. And she just wouldn't come. And so I finally stepped on a rock in the creek, all right? And I put my hand out to her, and I said, take my hand. It's going to be okay. And she closed her eyes, and she took my hand, and I pulled her across, and, she, and then she came over to, to where I was. And in that moment, she looked up at me, and she said, God must have sent you. <laughs> and I heard that, and I was like, <laughs> maybe he did. <laughs> well, ladies, you know, I, I, I just started... You know, I was a teenage kid, you know, it just immediately, right to my head, you know, I didn't even realize how, how fast it had happened. And you need to keep, and when you think about this, from their perspective, I, you know, I'm the one that came in and saved them, but that isn't what happened. They, they were in trouble, and I was, happened to be walking by. God probably had me in that moment for that reason. I went tearing in there. It was totally a God thing. But from their perspective, I'm the guy that came in and saved them. So it was natural for them to want to attribute, to attribute power to me and courage to me that I really didn't have. Because if I had seen that snake, I might have been screaming too, you know. <laughs> so that's how it works. But on a more serious note, um, I can remember in my first ministry, um, and it was like my first year of ministry, uh, there was a dear elderly saint um, who, who had went in for a procedure, um, a calf, and, uh, and something, it, it kind of went bad, uh, and he, he, he crashed and had a, he stroked out under the anesthesia, and he didn't wake up. Uh, and he was alive, but they, they weren't sure what was going on with him. Uh, and so I went down there to be with the family, and for whatever reason, the hospital wasn't communicating with the family. So the family knew something was terribly wrong. They weren't sure what was going on, um, and they hadn't seen him in a while. And they just didn't know what to do, as, as families often are in those situations. A pastor's job sometimes is to advocate for them. And so I just started getting around asking questions. And uh, I finally got a hold of a nurse, and they said, actually, we know where he is, and uh, we can take you to him now. And so I grabbed the family. I said, follow me. And they took us right into the room. 
And when we walked into the room, uh, it was a terrifying sight because he was, he was tubed up, he was not conscious, but it looked like he was in pain. And he was like flailing his arms, and you know, he just, he looked very much in pain. I had, we, none of us expected to see that. I walked in, they saw him, and they absolutely flipped out, and they, ra- they ran to his side and screaming and crying. Their, uh, their grandson um, was so upset that he was like, we got, I mean, it, it, in the moment, people say crazy things, but they, you know, they was like, we got to pull his tubes, we got to put him out of his misery. I mean, it was absolutely the most uncomfortable situation I've ever been in in my entire life. Um, I, can, I can remember grabbing the grandson and saying, stop, stop, stop. And, f- and in, that, in that craziness, one of the family members says, Pastor Dan, do something. <laughs> and I was like, oh, let's pray, you know. <laughs> and I mean, boy, I prayed. I don't remember what I said. I closed my eyes. I was like, please, God. And I, I, was thinking to myself the whole time, <laughs> I was thinking to myself the whole time, God, get me out of this. But I was also praying for that situation. And I'm not lying that I closed my eyes, and I began to pray. And I don't even remember what I said. I, it was all a haze to me. But when I opened them, he was completely calm and, and, and silent, and he had completely relaxed, and everything had stopped. And the entire family looked at me, and they were like, what did you do? And I can remember at that moment going, I don't know. <laughs> and it was like, in both cases, you know, I'm just a bread passer. You know, and when you're out there in the trenches and you're ministering, you're going to be passing the bread sometimes. Sometimes kingdom power is going to pass through. And when it does, they're going to say, you did it. But you didn't. All right? You didn't. And so long as you remember that, you're going to be okay. Uh, y- you think back to like Acts chapter 3 when, when the beggar was healed and Peter said, why are you guys looking at me like we did this? You know, that's what people do. And so long as you keep reminding, as long as you know that it wasn't you, and you keep reminding people where the power really lies, you're going to be fine. But if you ever start believing that, that there's something special about you, that God chose you because you're so whatever, you're, you're going to go off the cliff real quick. Because, I mean, I'm not trying to sound overly, God loves you, God loves everyone here, but you're nothing special. Anybody can pass the bread, and he's just pa- passing the bread through you. What really matters is that you're there doing it, and when you're there doing it, things like that are going to happen, okay? And so... We are called to pass the bread, all right? We are called to be there and present for that to happen. And what we're going to do now is we're going to just think of this in terms of communion because what we're about to receive now in communion is something that is designed to be treasured and it's designed to be passed, okay? It's designed to be treasured and it's designed to be passed. And so what we're going to do now is just pray. We're just going to quiet our hearts before the Lord. And then we're going to just partake of the elements together.